Jonathan, it's a, it's a good day to be at MPD. It's a good day to be at uh, MFD. It's just a good day to be in the city of Metro because of, uh, of some good news is, and that's that we have made an arrest in that string of arson fires that we've been talking about for a long time. I mean, it goes back from 2011, the summer of 2011, through the, to the end of 2013. Um, and a lot of time, energy, and effort by a lot of people, and we'll speak to that in a little bit. But, but it finally came to a head. Finally came to a head yesterday evening, uh, March 5th, at about 6:15 p.m. Um, MPD detectives, along with an investigator from ATF, that's the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, a federal agency, executed a search warrant at the suspect's residence, which uh, we'll speak to him in a sec, Manoa Hall, in the 100 block of South Mountain Avenue in Ashland. He was arrested at that time on the charges we'll speak to in a sec, which concern arson, criminal mischief. Uh, he was arrested without incident. There were several items of evidence seized from his residence to include methamphetamine, so he has additional drug charges as well. Um, he was, the evidence there suggested that he was also involved in both the manufacture and delivery of methamphetamine. When I say manufacture, he did not have a meth lab, but any time that you take a amount of a controlled substance and you break it up into smaller amounts, um, for the intent to distribute you have manufactured. So that's where that manufacturing charge comes from. So I certainly want to thank uh, Metro Fire. They put a lot of, Metro Fire and Rescue put a lot of time, energy, and effort into this. We got a couple of fire inspectors here today that, that uh, if you need to speak to them, they're certainly uh, available to do that. I certainly want to thank uh, ATF for assisting us. Detective Williams got ATF involved in this a while back as well for their federal assistance. And the Oregon State Police Crime Lab, I can't say enough good things about them because we do have forensic evidence in this case and that is really key to this investigation. Although we won't speak specifically to forensic evidence, it's certainly key to the success of, of where we're at at this point. The suspect's uh, photos up here, we, we uh, tried to keep it off the tweet, but I'm sure other people beat us to the punch, but uh, Manolo Hall, that is, his, that is his photo. He's a 38-year-old male that's living in the 100 block of Mountain Avenue from Ashland at the time of his arrest. He had previous addresses on Homeview, on West 11th, on Prune Street and also in Talent, Oregon, uh, all prior to his uh, last month's address, approximately for the last 30 days in the 100 block of South Mountain Avenue. He was charged with arson one, which is arson of first degree concerning protected property, three counts, arson second degree, four counts, attempted arson second degree, one count, criminal mischief in the first degree, three counts, criminal mischief in the second degree, and, and as I mentioned previously, the possession, manufacturing, delivery of methamphetamine. So last night he was lodged in the county jail with a bail of about 1.6 million. And uh, next to me is Nick Guile, the deputy district attorney from Jackson County that can speak to any specific questions you have about the charges and what happens next. But uh, I'll sort of entertain some questions. The map behind me is, and again, the, this case is still an investigation, lost of film, but you got to understand that there's a lot of fires in a particular area. So when you see, there, I, I counted these, there's 22 of them on here. There's a couple of outliers that are probably uh, not connected and should be on this map, but they got on the map anyways because it was early on in an investigation. But as you can see, the core of, of uh, West and Southwest Medford specifically, there's 20 of them. And you can see where the E's are located. That's where evidence was collected in reference to this investigation. So we tried to simplify it a little bit, but there's obviously going to be other fires that aren't connected. There's going to be other other uh, evidence that could be collected downstream. The other thing I want to point out is, is I'm convinced, and so the investigators in this case, that there's probably other vacant residences or foreclosed residences or other protected property that there was an attempt to light a fire or a small fire started and smoldered and went out that is still undetected. So we reiterated that early on in this, and we'll do it again, that if those property owners or landlords or property managers discover that, they want they're going to want to contact us. We're going to want to get Medford Fire and ourselves involved in that because there's going to be other cases that are still undiscovered, and there'll be evidence in those cases that are still connected to this case. So uh, there's probably still some out there that have been unreported that we want to know about, and there's certainly an opportunity for us to collect evidence on those as well. Chief, what's the suspect's name? His name is Manoa Hall, and Mike should be passing out some hard copy press releases in reference to that. Manoa so, Martin Hall is a 38-year-old male from the 100 block of South Mountain Avenue in Ashland. Was there a signature that was left behind that allowed you to link all these fires together? Again, I can speak to specific evidence. Um, there's a signature. When you're talking about time and place, obviously there's a method of operation that involves 
suspects involved in this type of activity and that method of operation is certainly key to how this thing moved forward. Obviously Manoho was a suspect. There were other suspects, possible suspects, I mean not named suspect, but there were other people that were certainly looked at throughout this investigation, but as Detective William, Williams may speak or may not, he's in the back of the room here too, he's the case agent on this. Uh, Mr. Hall became a focal suspect uh, this past summer in reference to his activities and our contacts with him. And as you can see from the from the press release, we became aware of him after observing him at a few fire scenes. So the subject was at fire scenes at the time. He was identified as Manoa Hall, a 38-year-old male. He's also had some internet postings. And he revealed that he had also videotaped fire scenes prior to the arrival of emergency crews, as well as significant footage of fire trucks in general. So that was a bit odd in itself, uh, which again, just, just uh, uh, more information that kept leading us back to Mr. Hall. Chief George, do you believe he's acting or was acting alone? We only have one person in custody at this time, and I don't see us at this point uh, naming anybody else or having anybody else. So I would, I would say that's the least safe at this point. But again, there may be information downstream. I don't want to eliminate something or something else that may come up downstream. Chief, how did you become aware of Manoa Hall? Well, that last paragraph observed at the scene of fires. Right. Was there any other involvement with other people bringing in tips? There was, there was information that came to us throughout this thing. And again, I'm hoping that more tips come additionally now that this has been posted up as well. Um, maybe people know this person, know some of his activities or where this person's been. So there's, there's, this is to our advantage as well as it is to your advantage because we got an opportunity here to increase information and also try and identify other locations where this may still be unreported. So certainly we had, we had information that was coming to us during the summer. Uh, we spent a lot of time and effort, so did Medford Fires uh, in these cases, but uh, there was a lot of, I don't want to call it back office work, but a, a lot of a work by just about every member of MPD for an extended period of time on this, from surveillance, from, from the research, from the types of things that you're looking at, just the volume of fires and the volumes of cases and the volumes of information that you have to sift through to try and put this stuff together. And again, can't say enough of good things about the assistance of our, our fire officials, the crime lab, ATF, and, and, and now the DA's office because it, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens when everybody's operating together and trying to make these kind of cases come together. So it's, a, it's certainly a, a team effort. And I would love to talk about forensic evidence. I'd love to talk about statements. I'd love to talk about all that stuff, but we will talk about that um, downstream at trial. We won't talk about that now. Does the suspect have a criminal record in Jackson County? He does, and you guys will have access to that through OGEN. You guys can look at that. I can't speak to anything but uh, prior arrest by MPD and, and uh, prior convictions that would be on OGEN, but uh, he does, and you'll see that. You mentioned internet postings. What were these uh, types of things? You mentioned video, but was he talking about the fire specifically themselves? And I don't think specifically on a specific fire, but uh, Detective Williams can come up here and explain to you some of the YouTube postings, and I think some of that stuff's still out there if you want to look at it. So you posted it on YouTube or social media, you found it like publicly. Correct. Yeah, that stuff's out in the, in the public venue, so that stuff is still available to you. And, and like I said, the case agent, Detective Williams, is here and can speak to that if you have any further questions in reference to that. Can you talk about uh, what was on these YouTube videos and what were some of these messages that he'd left? Yeah, one of the first um, YouTube postings that we viewed was actually one of the first uh, fires that kind of showing up on the map, it was a barn fire, and the, the YouTube posting basically just showed um, the fire in progress prior to, long, uh, prior to fire actually even showing up, and, and kind of just documented verbally what was happening at the time. Uh, it was just kind of, it was taken at night, and it was, it was, there was some conversation that went back and forth uh, between the uh, person taking the video and somebody that walked up on that person taking the video, and they, they discussed the causation of that fire a little bit. That video has now been taken off of YouTube. Hmm. How did the video end? Like, did he stop whenever, you know, officials showed up? Or how did, the, how did those things end? It, it just ended, yeah. And I, I would say that, that whether he just quit taking the video or it was uh, that fire showed up, yeah, it just ended. And there were similar postings on other videos, too? Yeah, if you go to YouTube and, and you guys do your research mm -hmm. on, on YouTube, you'll, what you could find is numerous videos that were posted. Uh, there's still a lot of them are still out there. A lot of them talk or show uh, fixation with trains 
So you'll see a lot of trained videos uh, out there, but there's also a lot of videos of responding fire apparatus and uh, just people taking, or not people, but this particular individual taking uh, fo photos, uh, video of fire apparatus responding to uh, scenes. Were there Facebook posts and other types of social media too that you followed up on? Uh, not to that extent uh, that was on YouTube. Not that in the world that we live in now, not that the postings of social media are that unusual. I mean, I, I, uh, I might crank out my cell phone and take a picture of some guy landing a, uh, a big fish at, uh, at uh, Horseshoe Bend or Griffin Park or wherever because I'm a fisherman. But that in itself, not unusual to, if it was just the one thing. But when you add all of the other things together, when you're talking about the locations where that individual is living, the number of fires that you had, those type of postings, the other forensic evidence, the other witness statements that we gathered, when you put it all together, it, it becomes a substantial case, and, and I will leave it at that. I don't want to talk, I, I don't want to talk about evidence because we're not supposed to, and we're, we're, we really run the risk of, of damaging a case when you talk about specific evidence prior to trial, and that's, that's why uh, Nick Gow is here to smack me in the side of the face when I do that. So, <laughs> so uh, we, won't, we won't do that, although th those questions will, will certainly be asked, and those answers will come out uh, downstream. Has the suspect confessed to the crime that he's accused of? I'm sorry. That I, he's accused, has he confessed to them? We wouldn't speak to any statements. Don't speak to statements either. That's that's off the table. What about his arrest last night? Was he was he fighting you guys or how did how he did wasn't? He, go? he was arrested without incident. There wasn't a, there wasn't an issue there. There was a search warrant served immediately after his arrest at that address. So there's additional evidence seized from his residence, and he'd been at that residence for close to a month. So again. Some of that stuff has to be sifted through. There may be stuff that gets submitted on that as well. Any family around at the time of the arrest or anything? I can't speak to that. I don't know. Do you have a damage total on all of these fires? And I knew you were going to ask that. Um, and again, that, that's a hard one to compile. I, I know that fire has certain damage amounts. Um, but specifically, I think for the crimes he's being charged right now, just the crimes that are on the press release, I think it's 110000 yeah. Was the search warrant related to methamphetamine or on suspicion of these arsons? No, the search warrant's based on the arsons. The methamphetamine was just uh, additional um, gravy afterwards. Back in September, you guys were at the Peach Street fire, and we were told that the, there were small fires being set inside the homes, and then the suspect was able to leave. Is that possibly? I mean, I know you're not allowed to speak to specifics, but is that something that was the case of every single fire? I can't speak to specific evidence on specific crimes. I can just tell that these were specific selected. These are vacant residences. I mean, in these kind of cases, that this suspect I would suggest would be very lucky because in in certain neighborhoods and in certain locations where those residents are, are obviously boarded up or vacant or foreclosed property or whatever it is, it's not unusual for people that are homeless to sneak into those places and crash when I, especially if it's if it's uh, if there's a weather issue or, or there's, there's lack of housing for those folks. So there certainly could have been a possibility that one of these could have been occupied at the time. That's just probably luck on the suspect's part that someone wasn't injured uh, or, or killed in a fire like that. And then you also have the risk to firefighters that go into uh, those particular buildings to, to fight the fire too with that kind of risk. But as far as the locations and the spots and the types of fires, the the method of operation is something we're going to keep close to the best at this point because it's again part and partial to that circumstantial case in addition to the forensic evidence that, that built this case. Were any of these not homes? Were any of them other types of buildings or residences? I think there's a barn in there on one of them. And a uh, outbuilding. An outbuilding uh, and a yeah, barn. Yeah. Okay. Is there any possibility that he could be linked to other fires that happened during the same time period like the Barney's Burgers, the CJ Post Office, or the church fire that was in West Bedford? I, I can't speak to that right now. I don't. I don't have information that I could even speak intelligently to that. Are you able to speak to his original intents? Um, was he trying to see something burn or possibly hurt firefighters or other people? I, I can't speak to his intent. Again, that stuff that's going to going to be downstream. That stuff that's going to be uh, trial time.